I didn't realize I'd be the only one in a full suit this morning. <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, I am so glad to be here with you. I want to thank you for the invitation, and I appreciate the opportunity to be back in fellowship with you. It doesn't happen often enough. I also want to uh, pause and say thank you for your support for the ministry budget of BCM. Um, we cannot operate without support from churches like yours. And not only do we need you to help fund us, um, right now I need your prayers. We are, my leadership team is moving in on Tuesday. We're meeting on Wednesday. And honestly, we still don't know what we're going to be able to do to reach students this fall. It is, uh, I celebrated my 63rd birthday uh, this week. I never knew I was going to have to relearn how to do BCM after 33 years. So please pray for us. The need is greater than it's ever been. There are more and more students identifying themselves as no religion of any kind. And people need the gospel. And that's why we're there. And we serve on behalf of churches. And so please pray for us as we begin. Let's bow again and pray together. Marvelous God, we come into your presence this morning with thanksgiving. It's good to be together with brothers and sisters in Christ. It is good to be in your house, in a place that we've set aside to worship you. And it's good to lift our voices together and sing your praise. But now, Lord, help us to listen, not to my words, but I pray that the words that I speak could help someone to hear the still, small voice of your Spirit. Because we need a word from you today. And having heard, help us to take it to heart and help us to be changed to become more like you. We're made in your image. Help us to reflect that image in every action, in every relationship, and to the depth of our being. Help us to honor you. Amen. This morning, I want to invite your attention to the Gospel of John, chapter 21. If you need help, go to the book of Acts and look back a page. Okay? John chapter 21, and we're going to start reading in verse 15. And honestly, age does catch up. This will make it easier. There, I can actually see it now. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. And Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. 
Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter uh, saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Going to skip down uh, just a bit, uh, or just a phrase or two, but Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Peter, as leader of the bunch, in discouragement, in despair, who knows? I don't know all the emotions involved, but he'd gone fishing. There's a reflection here in previous days. As a matter of fact, if you go back to Mark chapter 1, verses 16 to 20, this is the exact situation that Jesus found Peter when he first met him. He was fishing. And in that situation, Jesus had said to Peter and Andrew, and then again to James and John, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Pay attention to that. We're going to get back to that a little later. You know, when I, I grew up on the banks of the Coosa River, my granddaddy, grandmother, built a house right next to us shortly after we moved there, and my granddad built himself a very heavy, flat bottom boat out of marine plywood. It would have been very hard to turn that boat over. It was that heavy and wide. Had a little bitty outboard motor on the back. You weren't going to set any speed records, but it would take you upriver. My cousin Terry and I used to use the boat and go upriver and float down and uh, down back down toward the docks, and we would fly fish for brim. You know, I haven't since I moved away from home. Have never done any fishing again. But we used to enjoy that, and I guess as a kid, it's better than the, the cane pole and the float in the water where you just sit there. With a fly rod, you're constantly doing something. And by the way, to this day, I'm still a little bit hyperactive. So, you know, it keeps you busy. But we enjoyed fly fishing like that. But that was recreation, not vocation. Peter vocationally was a fisherman. He did it for a living. They had customers. It's how they brought in income for their family. And apparently, they were pretty successful at it. So he knew what he was doing when he went back to fishing. But after his betrayal of Jesus, his denial that he ever knew him, the guilt, every bit of baggage that he was carrying, the fact that Jesus was killed, he was buried. Peter went back to the thing that he knew. This wasn't just a cane pole bobbing on the water. This was nets trying to get back to something that they knew. But Jesus showed up. By the way, let's don't get too hard on Peter. After all, when they came to arrest him, isn't he the one that pulled out a sword to, kind of, to try to defend Jesus? Everybody else ran away. Maybe that's why he had his other disciples with him, is they were discouraged too. But Peter's the focus here. And Jesus calls him aside after the morning meal. And he, said, and he confronts him. One of the things that I, I 
believe about us today is we don't like to see people uncomfortable. But I want you to notice here, Jesus did not let Peter off the hook. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. But Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you really love me more than these? One of the things that I've noticed is there are a lot of people who are good at confessing sins. We are good at confessing sins, but we're not real good at repentance. Confession and repentance are two different things. As a matter of fact, I've heard some people confess that it sounds more like they're bragging. Oh, yeah, I do this, that, or the other. That's just who I am. Yes, they're confessing, but I don't hear a word of repentance. Repentance is turning away from our sins. Repentance is rejecting our sins. Repentance is recognizing that in the words of David in Psalm 51, that it is against God and God alone that I have sinned. Repentance is seeing my actions with the same eyes that God sees them and how revulsive they are. In verse 7 of John 21, when Peter recognized Jesus, while they were still offshore, he dove into the water and swam to shore. He acknowledged Jesus there. And I think we see the heart of Peter way back in John chapter 6 when people were starting to turn away, uh, turn away when Jesus turned up the heat on discipleship. And he asked his disciples, will you two go away? And Peter's words are, and I'm going to paraphrase into my words, Jesus, where would we go? Only you have the words of life. Even in his despair, Peter recognized that hope is found only in Jesus. But on that path, later on, it says John was following them, so apparently they walked away from the group. But as they walked, there was an uncomfortable, an awkward confrontation that Jesus had with Peter. That's the familiar story of Peter, do you love me? There's no dodging this conversation. It's just Peter and Jesus. There's no getting away from it. Peter boasted big. Even if everybody else turns away, I'll never deny you, Jesus. Well, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times tonight. And it happened. Maybe it was this downfall that led Peter to disqualify himself from following Jesus. Maybe he's back at fishing for the first time in forever, but Jesus met Peter in his failure. And he didn't say, oh, that's okay. Don't worry about it. What he did do is lead him through his failure to repentance and through repentance to restoration. And in each step of this process, He directed him back to His original calling. He reworded it here to a shepherd imagery, but it is the same. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. By the way, all of us have failed. If we take off our nice proper clothing 
and get back to who we really are? If I were at home, I would be in gym shorts and a t-shirt. I didn't think that was quite appropriate to wear here this morning. But it's a lot more comfortable than a suit and tie, let me tell you. And I will be back to that very soon after I hit the door to my house this afternoon. But the Bible says when we get down to where we are and who every one of us is, that we have all sinned. We all fall short of what God intends for our lives. The Bible says that because of our sin, we all deserve death, eternal separation from God. But, the, but Paul wrote uh, more in Romans. He says, but even while we were still sinners, God loved us and He sent Jesus to die for us. So what, does it, what do we need to do? We need to respond to God's initiative in reaching out to us. You cannot come to salvation without confession and repentance and making Jesus the Lord of your life. And you know what? As a follower of Jesus, when I experience the embarrassing failures, the shortcomings, let's, put, let's just put it in plain language, when I sin against my Savior, it's the same thing. Not to get salvation back, to, but, but to be back in right relationship with God. It requires my confession and repentance. Salvation is repent and believe. But so is coming back into a right relationship with my Savior. But I want us also to see that this story is not just about that res uh, restoration, but the path to that restoration is about avoiding excuses. Now let's face it. If my sin is brought out in the open... I'm going to try to switch the focus. I'm going to start talking about Nikki and what she's done. I want y'all to see her and get that spotlight off me. Isn't that what Peter did in this passage? John's following. Peter's squirming. He says, Jesus, what about him? What about him? You know, Jesus, I'm not the only person that messed up. Jesus, I grabbed that sword. I tried to defend you. All those chickens did were run away. At least I got one good ear cut off before I ran. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked a little bit about some of this. He says, I want to get the speck out of your eye and I'm going to ignore the big old board that's in my own. I can see your deficiencies so clearly and I can be blind to my own sin. I see what I want to see I hear what I want to hear, but my eyes can be clothed to the truth of Scripture and my ears can be deaf to the still, small voice of God speaking to me. And what Jesus called Peter to do was to focus. Feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. And Peter, follow me. No excuses, no deflection, no passing the buck, no pointing fingers at anyone else. So I want to get back to fishing. 
right down here on New Liberty Roads where my granddaddy Britton had a farm. A big pond in the pasture behind the house. On Sunday afternoons as we would go over to visit, um, granddad would go by the bakery in Gadsden after uh, going to the curb market and he would get old bread that they were going to throw away. He would bring it back toss it in a crib, and on Sunday afternoons, we would go over there and grab a couple of loaves of bread, tear it up into pieces, and throw the bread out on the water and watch the fish hit it. It was fun. But you know what? That wasn't fishing. The fun thing was is the times we did go fishing, all you had to do is put a piece of bread on a hook. You could catch some fish, especially those brim in that pond. It was fun. Did you notice Jesus in this incident? points Peter back to his original call to him in his life. Peter, follow me. And later on, Peter, after he tries to point the finger at John, he says, Peter, you follow me. Maybe we're at the point this morning that you need to hear the voice of Jesus, not for somebody else sitting beside you or across the room, but just the call of Jesus for your life. And that is, follow me. I don't know where you are in your relationship to Jesus. I don't know what sin you have done, but I know that sometimes it's easy to feel like I'm disqualified. I can't follow him. But I don't want you to despair this morning. The same Savior who called you to salvation is still seeking you to restore you to the joy of your salvation. In the words of Jesus in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, to the church at Ephesus, he says, you have forsaken your first love. But he also says to that church at Ephesus, Though you've forsaken your first love, repent. When we have fallen short as followers of Jesus, the call to us each day is to repent and to hear those words that he spoke to Peter that day when he said, feed my sheep. Don't let anything else distract you. Follow me. And remember, he called Peter. He's called each of us to be fishers of men. So today, do you need to repent? Do you need to refocus? Do you need to be renewed in your relationship with Jesus? Let's pray together. I thank you this morning, Father, that you're still in the business of calling people to a relationship with you. And Father, once we give our lives to Jesus, when we are distracted, when we fall short, when we turn away, you're still in the business of calling us back. So, Father, this morning, whose hearts are you speaking to? Who needs to respond? What are you saying today? As we come to a time of response, continue to work in us. In the name of Jesus, amen.